If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode contains descriptions of domestic violence and murder. If you or someone you know is facing domestic violence, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-7233. The death threat came in February of 1935. It was mailed from Long Island to the actress Thelma Todd in care of the How Roach Movie Studio in California. Pay $10,000 to Abe Lyman in New York by March 5th and live. If not, our San Francisco boys will lay you out. This is no joke. Thelma took the matter very seriously. After reporting the threat to the authorities, the press wrote that she went into seclusion under guard. Maybe she knew better than most that it was no laughing matter because of her past. Just the year before, she had gotten a divorce from Pascali Pat DeChico. Reporters at the time described DeChico as a theatrical agent, but today he is best remembered for something entirely different. DeChico, a mobster connected to Lucky Luciano, is said to have been one of the men who beat to death Ted Healy, the founder of the Three Stooges. We will have more to say about that later. DeChico beat Thelma too. Their relationship was marred by repeated acts of domestic violence. The aftermath of one especially awful episode saw Thelma requiring an emergency operation on her appendix. When she filed for divorce in 1934, she alleged that she had suffered through extreme acts of cruelty at the hands of DeChico. So, when she received this letter, perhaps a part of her wondered if it had somehow originated with DeChico. And maybe that is why she took it so gravely. But, for whatever reason, other people did not seem to regard it as seriously as she did. Abe Lyman, the man named in the note as the intended recipient of the payoff to keep Thelma alive, thought the whole thing was a merry prank. He told the AP that someone was ribbing Thelma. The boys in Los Angeles have been having a lot of fun, he said. Law enforcement seemed to have doubts, too, telling the press that they viewed the seriousness of the death threat with, quote, frank skepticism. In any case, after a few days, the whole matter seemed to fade away. The press stopped writing about it, and it soon was all but forgotten. The only reason it has not completely slipped from the public consciousness today is that in December of 1935, less than a year after the death threat, Thelma Todd was found dead at the age of 29 under mysterious circumstances. And even now, all these decades later, no one is entirely sure how she died or who may have been responsible for it. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders. 
1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We're the murder sheet, and this is Killed the Cafe, the mysterious Hollywood death of Thelma Todd. Even if you don't recognize the name Thelma Todd, there's a good chance you've seen her. After coming to Hollywood in the 1920s, Thelma's beauty and comedic chops soon earned her roles alongside screen legends like the Marx Brothers, Laurel and Hardy, and Buster Keaton. So if you've ever spent an evening watching Turner classic movies, there's a decent chance that you've seen Thelma and that she may even have given you a laugh or two. Thelma's talents went beyond comedy. For instance, she starred in the original 1931 film version of The Maltese Falcon. And Thelma had business interests besides acting. In 1934, she partnered up with film director Roland West and his wife, Jewel Carmen, to open up a restaurant called Thelma Todd's Sidewalk Cafe. Now, if you're like us, the term sidewalk cafe suggests a certain mental image. A small, hole-in-the-wall business with perhaps a few tables sitting outside. We need to stress that this is not what Thelma Todd's sidewalk cafe was like. It was located on the ground floor of a three-story, 15,000-square-foot structure that had originally been built to house a shopping center. Todd and West lived in two apartments on the second floor, but we should mention that those apartments seem to have been separated only by a single sliding door between their bedrooms. West was often described in the press as Thelma's best friend, but that cozy living arrangement made many speculate that their relationship went far beyond friendship and a business partnership. West, though, claimed the reason he had an apartment on site was entirely due to the business. Running the sidewalk cafe required him to often work late. Sometimes, when he completed his obligations at the restaurant, he would be so tired that it would be easier for him to simply go upstairs and go to sleep. We will have more to say on all that later. The apartments were not the only things on the second floor of the sidewalk cafe building. It also contained a small nightclub named Joya's. Up on the third floor, there was a dance floor and a bandstand. This impressive building would later be deeded to Paulist Productions, a Catholic production company headed in the early 2000s by Father Frank Desiderio. The Sidewalk Cafe was clearly a major and substantial business. And a big part of its appeal relied on the personal popularity of Thelma Todd herself. She was a magnet, Father Desiderio explained to the Los Angeles Times. She would bring people in. She was a huge star. But because she also liked to go out, there were some nights she wasn't here, which would drive Roland West up the wall. He would say, you're my money maker, and if you're not here, I'm not making money. West was not the only man said to be upset with Thelma for reasons related to the sidewalk cafe. She was alleged to be involved in an affair with a notorious gangster, Lucky Luciano. Being connected in any way with a man like that is inherently risky. But Thelma gave Luciano a very specific reason to get angry with her. When Luciano looked at the sidewalk cafe, he saw opportunity. 
it seemed to him like it would make a wonderful front for some of his major criminal activities, including gambling. Thelma, quite understandably, did not like that. Not only could a business connection to Luciano expose her to potential criminal liability, it could also tarnish the reputation of the sidewalk cafe, causing it to lose customers. She supposedly told Luciano that she would allow him to operate in the sidewalk cafe only over her dead body. And Luciano is alleged to have replied, that can be arranged. With all of this background in mind, let's jump to December 14th, 1935, the last night Thelma Todd was known to be alive. That night, Thelma went to a party at the Trocadero nightclub and she took pains to look her best for it. Not only did she wear a beautiful evening gown and fur coat, but she also had on about $20,000 worth of diamond jewelry. She was definitely dressed to impress. She and West exchanged some cross words before she left. Remember, Father Desiderio pointed out that West didn't like it when Thelma spent her evenings away from the sidewalk cafe. He felt it was bad for business. Things didn't improve much for Thelma at the Trocadero. She ran into her former husband, Pat DeChico, there. He was there with another woman, a minor actress named Margaret Lindsay. The press would speculate he brought another woman to the party because he knew Thelma would be there and he wanted to embarrass his ex. But, in any case... Thelma and DeChico got into some sort of confrontation, probably made worse by the fact that both of them had been drinking. But Thelma didn't let any of this spoil her fun. She stayed out late, enjoying herself, and finally had Ernest Peters, her chauffeur, drive her back to the sidewalk cafe. They got back there around 4 a.m. Here is where things start to get a little unusual. Typically, when Peters dropped Thelma off, he would offer to walk her up the steps to the outside entrance of her second-floor apartment. And, typically, she would accept. But this night was different. He made the offer, and, for some reason, she declined. And so she walked up the steps alone. This was the last time she was confirmed to be seen alive. May Whitehead was the one who found Thelma Todd. May was Thelma's maid. She arrived for work around 10.30 a.m. Monday morning and, as was her custom, she headed straight for the garage that Thelma shared with Roland West. The garage was located 271 steps up from the entrance to the sidewalk cafe. Thelma did not much like making that walk any more than she had to. So, when May came to work, she would go to the garage, move Thelma's car out, park her own car inside, and then drive Thelma's car down by the entrance of the cafe. That way, Thelma could have an easier time getting to it whenever she might need it during the day. May opened the closed door of the garage and carrying a few odds and ends, walked over to the passenger side of Thelma's car to drop them off. And then, when she opened the door, she saw Thelma. She was slumped in the front seat of her car, May said to the police, just bent over, her head to the left. The actress was still wearing the beautiful clothes from the night of the party at the Trocadero, still looking as lovely as ever. For a moment, May allowed herself to believe that Thelma was all right, that she had merely fallen asleep in her car, even though she had never done that before. I went around to the left side of the car, the driver's side, and I thought I could awaken her, said May. It was only then that May saw the driver's side door was open. She also noticed there was blood around Thelma's nose. May realized then that Thelma Todd was dead. But how did it happen? And who was responsible? 
A grand jury was called to investigate and to get the answers to just those questions. But they ran into difficulties right away. For one thing, they sensed that some of the witnesses were out and out lying to them, either directly or by omission. Some of those witnesses who appear most mute, most dumb, apparently are deliberately concealing facts, grand jury foreman George Rochester told the press. Potent Hollywood interests have attempted to block the probe into Todd's death from the beginning. And some of the witnesses certainly acted as if they had something to hide. Shortly after Thelma's body was discovered, for instance, her ex-husband, Pat DeChico, took a sudden trip across the country to visit family. But police tracked him down and got him to return to California, and even went so far as to place him under technical custody as soon as he got off the plane. What the hell's the matter with you guys? An annoyed DeChico demanded to the court officers who met him with subpoenas. They hustled him pretty quickly in front of the grand jury, but his testimony was brief. Fifteen minutes after entering the jury room, the UP reported, DeChico emerged, smiling cynically, slipped on his camel's hair overcoat, and walked off, while foreman George Rochester admitted DeChico had been unable to give us any information which had any bearing on the case. The grand jury concluded their investigation shortly thereafter, and the Homicide Bureau ended up concluding that Thelma Todd's death had been nothing more than an accident of some sort, with no criminal activity behind it. But over the years, not too many people have been satisfied with that answer. So let's take a look at the three men who have most often been mentioned as having been involved in the death of Thelma Todd. First, there is her former husband, Pat DeChico, who she is known to have seen and quarreled with in the final hours of her life. So who exactly was DeChico? Though he might have described himself vaguely as a theatrical agent, the truth is that he was a mob-connected figure said to be Lucky Luciano's man in Hollywood. And he was violent. Let's return to the story we alluded to at the beginning of this episode, the tale of the death of Ted Healy. Though largely forgotten today, Ted Healy was a popular vaudeville performer back in the day. His most lasting contribution to popular culture was certainly an act called Ted Healy and His Stooges, the Stooges, of course, were Mo and Shemp Howard and Larry Fine. When they eventually got tired of working with Healy, they would move on and change their name to the Three Stooges. Healy, meanwhile, continued his life as usual, which, for him, meant going to one bar after another and getting very drunk. In December 1937, he visited the Trocadero, a popular eatery on the Sunset Strip. There, he ran into Pat DeChico, the character actor Wallace Beery, and Albert Broccoli, who would go on to produce the James Bond series of films. It is unclear what exactly happened next, but there seems to have been some sort of physical confrontation between the men inside the Trocadero. The group then went outside, where things got markedly worse. DeChico and Beery are said to have given Healy a brutal beating. It was so severe, in fact, that Healy soon fell into a coma and died. One reason why we don't know more details about what exactly occurred that night is because there was never much of an investigation. The power brokers in Hollywood in that era were notorious for doing whatever was necessary to protect their stars. And Wallace Beery was enough of a star that he merited that sort of care. So the public was informed that Healy had died of acute alcoholism, and Beery soon went on a conveniently timed extended trip to Europe. It is important to note, though, that DeChico's violence was not limited to men he argued with at bars. As we mentioned earlier, he got violent with Thelma, once injuring her so badly she needed to seek emergency care for her appendix. And he beat other women, too. By the early 40s, 
long after Thelma was dead, did Chico marry Gloria Vanderbilt. He belittled her. And that's not all. He would take my head and bang it against the wall, recalled Vanderbilt. I had black eyes. Like Thelma, Gloria Vanderbilt would end up divorcing De Chico. But, unlike Thelma, Gloria Vanderbilt would go on to enjoy a long and healthy life. We think it's clear that De Chico was capable of murdering Thelma Todd. But it feels like that if he did so, he likely would have chosen a more violent and brutal way of ending her life. That she probably would have ended up being beaten like Ted Healy instead of dying of asphyxiation in her car. True, there were media stories which suggested Thelma's body was in fact beaten, but it appears that those articles were inaccurate. Here is a quote from a piece Marvin J. Wolf wrote about the case for Los Angeles Magazine. Some news accounts described a tooth knocked from Todd's mouth. Others turned the few specks of blood found on Todd's lip into a fountain of gore. One police beat reporter wrote about great bruises inside Todd's throat, suggesting they'd been made by a Coke bottle. There was, in reality, no broken tooth or any bruises, and the tiny bit of bloody froth on Todd's lip was consistent with post-mortem changes in mucous membranes typical of carbon monoxide poisoning, facts contained in the coroner's report but never publicized. So we don't consider DeChico to be an especially compelling suspect. Now, another name that has come up, of course, is the mobster Lucky Luciano. The idea being that he arranged to have her killed because she wouldn't let him run his gambling operations out of her restaurant. This theory is perhaps best known through its presentation in Hot Toddy, a 1989 book by writer Andy Edmonds. That volume is purportedly non-fiction. But, incredibly, it concludes with a dramatic scene recounting dialogue exchanged between Luciano and Thelma, followed by her death at the hands of one of his goons soon after. Needless to say, the only people who could have known what Thelma and Luciano said at their alleged last parting were the two of them. Thelma died in 1935, and it is difficult to imagine Luciano ever making such a detailed confession to any source who might have talked to writer Edmonds. The scene reads as fiction. Luciano obviously was a mobster who was certainly capable of having people killed. But that alone clearly is not reason enough to convict him of complicity in Thelma's death. And there seems to be no reason to imagine that he ever specifically targeted Thelma Todd unless there is a fuller accounting of the sources behind the Luciano hypothesis, it is difficult to take it seriously as an option. Finally, we come to Roland West. He was the film director who became Thelma's business partner in the Sidewalk Cafe. As we mentioned, the press described the married West as Thelma's best friend. But that seems to be a euphemism. It is generally accepted today that the two of them were having an affair, an attachment that began soon after they first met in 1930. Their relationship was said to be tempestuous. West is reported to have been a controlling man with an often violent temper. But whatever we think of this affair, it did not stop Thelma from marrying De Chico in 1932, and it did not keep West from remaining married at least in name, to Jewel Carmen. In fact, at least on paper, Carmen was even one of the partners involved in owning and running the Sidewalk Cafe. We do know, though, that West was often unhappy with Thelma in regards to her obligations to the Sidewalk Cafe. Father Desiderio told the Los Angeles Times that, remarking that West was frustrated and annoyed when Thelma spent her evenings at other spots. And West was apparently upset with her on the night of her death for just that reason. That information comes from none other than Hal Roach. In case you don't recognize the name, Roach was a major producer of comedy short films in the 1930s, including the popular Our Gang series. 
In the 1980s, Roach gave an interview to the writer Marvin J. Wolfe and, for the first time, publicly revealed what he knew about this case. Wolfe wrote a terrific article about that interview and this case that is well worth reading in full. We will include a link to it in our notes. On the night of her death, West demanded that Thelma return from the Trocadero no later than 2 a.m. She did not like that and said she would set her own hours. And then she left for the nightclub. An annoyed West, according to Roach, received a phone call around 2.30 a.m. to let him know that Thelma was only then preparing to leave the nightclub. That is when West decided to have some revenge. He went to Thelma's apartment and locked the doors. And then he waited. Roach told Wolf. Apparently, when Todd returned at almost 4 a.m., she declined her chauffeur's offer to walk her upstairs because she knew there would be a scene with West. When she found the door locked, she shouted at him, and they had another argument through the door. West told her he didn't want her going to so many parties. Todd, still a bit drunk, screamed that she'd go to any party she pleased. She was invited to one later that day at Mrs. Wallace Ford's, and she said she'd just go to that party now. At this point, Thelma headed to the garage with an enraged West following not far behind. By the time he got there, she was in the car with the engine running. So West ran around and closed and locked the garage door. He wasn't thinking about carbon monoxide, Roach told Wolf, just about teaching her a lesson about who was the boss. So he left and went back to bed. The next day, West discovered Thelma's dead body. He didn't know what to do, Roach told Wolf, so he did nothing. He closed the door, but didn't lock it, and went back to the cafe. All that day, when people called for Thelma, he said he didn't know where she was. If he really hadn't known where she was, he would have been calling all over trying to find her. That's the kind of man he was. Wolf believes the whole matter was kept quiet to protect the film industry from another major scandal. At that time, after all, Film executives couldn't help but remember how the earlier Fatty Arbuckle rape and murder trial had negatively impacted the health of the industry. We have to say that Roach's account of West's complicity in Thelma's death seems quite plausible to us. And there's something else. Roland West's wife, Jewel Carmen, told police that she saw Thelma riding in a car on Hollywood Boulevard with, quote, a sleek, foreign-looking man, unquote, around 11 p.m. on December 15, 1935. To be clear, by that time, Thelma Todd had been lying dead in her garage for many hours. Did Jules Carmen claim to see Thelma with a man, one who certainly did not resemble her husband in the least, at a time when Thelma was already dead because she wanted to protect West? It seems possible, and it also seems like another reason to suspect West of guilt in this crime. On his deathbed, West himself even made a confession, admitting his responsibility for the death of Thelma Todd. All of this seems quite compelling, but we have to be honest. None of it even comes close to proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Roland West caused the death of Thelma Todd. But, at this late date, it is very unlikely that we will ever come up with evidence to meet that high burden. The grand jury and the detectives that originally investigated this case could have done that, though, if they'd made more of an effort in their work to get past the lying and evasive witnesses, then perhaps they could have gotten to the truth and brought Thelma the justice she deserved. It is heartbreaking to think of Thelma Todd's life getting snuffed out at the age of 29. She had so much more living to do. If you want to get a sense of what she was like as a performer, we encourage you to do a search for her on YouTube. You can see her bantering with Groucho Marx, getting a music lesson from Chico Marx, and getting into all sorts of shenanigans with Laurel and Hardy. 
She has been dead since 1935, long before most of us were even born. But her work makes her immortal. As long as people want a smile or a laugh, Thelma will be there, waiting to give it to them. While preparing this episode, we consulted material from the Oakland Tribune, the AP, the Los Angeles Times, the Santa Monica Daily Press, the Fresno Bee, Grunge.com, the Long Beach Sun, and the San Francisco Examiner. We also relied on Pacific Palisades History.org, Madeline Hiltz's work for Vintage News, and Benjamin McVeigh's work for Cinema Scholars. We also read The Tragic and Twisted Tale of the Three Stooges by Simon Brond for Empire Magazine, The Fixers by E.J. Fleming, The Ice Cream Blonde by Michelle Morgan, and Hot Toddy by Andy Edmonds. We would especially like to give a shout out to Marvin J. Wolf's article on the case for Los Angeles Magazine. We will include a link to it in our show notes and recommend you check it out. To our surprise, we've gotten a number of requests from people saying they would like a way to help financially support our efforts with the show. So if you are interested, we are relaunching a Patreon page, which you can find at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. Join us there for two live video question and answer sessions each month. You can ask us anything, suggest new cases for us to look at, or even offer ideas for new leads for us to follow. If Patreon is not your thing, you can buy us a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. Thanks for the interest. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.